we'll uh, just get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kathleen Warner, the director of Vermont Woodlands Association and the Vermont Concern Program. One of your hosts for this morning, uh, along with Vermont Coverts. We have Alicia Carlson with us from Vermont Coverts. Um, between us, we are going to um, kind of uh, manage the chat box. If you have any questions as we go along, you can stick them right in that chat box. We'll also have a little time for direct Q&A. If you have any questions you want to ask Nancy, um, we'll take those questions as well. This will be recorded so that you can go back and review this online. Uh, it will be hosted on, uh, on our websites and uh, YouTube channels, and that information will be in the chat box as well. Uh, turn up my mic, yeah. I have trouble with that sometimes. Let me see if I can increase the volume. Sit a little closer, talk a little louder. Is that better? Okay. I don't louder. Know. It's better? Not really? <laughs> All right. It's a good thing I'm not doing most of the talking today. That'll be up to me. <laughs> so um, I think I will turn the program over to Nancy. Uh, she has graciously agreed to be our county forester expert for this morning. Nancy is from Franklin and Grand Isle, and take it away, Nancy. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Uh, so as uh, Kathleen said, I'm Nancy Patch. I'm uh, the Franklin Grand Isle County Forester. Um, so we've been starting these coffee uh, with the county forester. Uh, and I thought it was a fabulous idea. I'm actually not sure who came up with it, but Ethan Tapper was our, our, our first guest and uh, he did an awesome show. Basically, it's really informal today that we really are just getting together as a group of people and talking about answering questions as much as I can, uh, anything that you might want to know about. My, my job as county forester is really a, mostly regarding e education. So 50% of my job is really looking at the current use program. So if there are questions about the current use program, I can help you with those. I What I do is I review and approve all of the forest management plans that are written in the two counties of my jurisdiction, which is Franklin and Grand Isle. Um, interesting thing about the county forester program is that the private lands program, we have 13 county foresters generally to cover the state and our own jurisdictions are so different from each other so it's really interesting to get together as county foresters and to listen to the different county foresters take on things because my my region in the northwest corner of the state is really so different than the county foresters that work in the southern part or are really anywhere even my next door colleagues in Lamoille and, and Orleans counties are, are different. So we all have a different perspective and can probably answer questions in a different way. So I think really what we want to do is just open this up and, uh, and see what people want to know about and we can go in whatever direction we flow in. And so I will I, I will tell you that I have muted folks so that we are um, not getting any feedback. If you want to say something, please just unmute your microphone. Oh, hi, Nancy. Ken Mink in Georgia. Um, Ken. Hi. Could you tell me how the EAB thing is going out on the islands? So um, we currently have. Uh, uh, identified EAB in South Hero and in Alberg. I think you may know that. Um, we expect things will be changing fairly quickly this summer. Uh, the insects are now just starting to probably emerge with a little bit of warmer weather. Um, this is fly season. It's the flying season. The adults will be out there for a few weeks and uh, and I, I expect we'll be seeing a lot more activity this summer and some more damage uh, spreading throughout the, the county. So far, we haven't gotten anything arriving in Franklin County that we found. It doesn't mean it's not here, um, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that. I'm happy to answer more questions around EAB if people have them. Um, it's a 
an insect that has caused havoc uh, across the country. Uh, one of the recommendations that we have is to make sure that we maintain ash on our landscape. We want to be sure that we have ash in the future. So what we don't want people to do is to cut all the ash trees down in their forest. There are kind of two components to managing ash. There's the uh, infrastructure at, along the roadways where we are actually recommending the removal of the, the uh, majority of the ash along uh, town highways and uh, state highways. And that's for safety reasons. So uh, and safety and actually the expense to communities because if all the ash dies all at once, trying to um, take those hazard trees down could um, be very, very expensive for communities. So we are encouraging slow but constant removal of ash along the highways. Completely different in the woods. Please, we ask people not to cut all the tree, all the ash trees in the forest and to make sure we keep all, a multiple age classes out there so that we have big trees pushing out some seed so that we have seed in, uh, trees in the future and some in the younger trees that may mi be missed by um, emerald ash borer and be retained in the landscape. Uh, so really keeping our ash in the forest is really what we want to do. So next it looks like we have a question about um, pulling honeysuckle. It says, I've been pulling honeysuckle like crazy. I assume I didn't get all the roots. When will they reemerge as sprouts? So I guess I'm not really sure I can say whether they would emerge as sprouts the next year or not. It's just a matter of monitoring it. Um, probably they will continue to re-sprout if there are some any roots left in the soil. Um, it's a, the potential for them to re-sprout is is possible. But you know the the nice thing about that once you have removed the the bulk of the roots, as those small ones re-sprout, they're from, they're much easier to pull out of the ground. And so there is a monitoring that continues. And that is the case for all invasives. They are, it's never a one and done. It's uh, even if you remove or you're able to remove the, the plants from your, from your landscape, they're still in the landscape. Depends on where you are in, um, in the state. When I was just out in uh, Grand Isle yesterday and the honeysuckle problem in Grand Isle is just dramatic. Uh, there is just, it's, it will be impossible to eradicate honeysuckle in that landscape, uh, but there, you can manage it. And one of the recommendations we have is to work from the outside in to the, to the infestation. So if there's a large infestation, try to keep the honeysuckle from spreading, particularly spreading into the woods. So you that would be scary. I'm sorry. I heard somebody say something, but um, so you put, you you kind of move into the infestation, so you're stopping the spread. Um, now, if you're up in the Northern Green Mountains in Franklin County, there's very few honeysuckle in that area, so you can indeed manage and eradicate invasive species in your landscape when you only have a few plants there. And always, the earlier you can get to an invasive species problem, the better off you are. So we highly encourage um, people to remove that one plant, those 10 plants. If you can remove 10 plants from your landscape, you're not going to have a problem. And if you can work with your neighbors, I know on my own property, I, my property was next to a nursery. So there had been honeysuckle being sold there for years. So honeysuckle had spread a little bit. I, had, I actually only found three plants on my property. I pulled them immediately. But then I went and talked to all my neighbors. So, and I said, if, would you like to assist in removing these plants? And if they didn't, I, I just asked, well, if you don't want to, quit on. <laughs> and so we really kind of made a, a quite an impact in our uh, small community. And there are, at this point, no honeysuckles uh, there. So we, if you have a small infestation, get rid of it and you can manage it in the future. I hope that helps. Oh, the questions are piling in now. So you, um, as I'm reading them, what are the invasive plants then that are a problem for you up in New York County? So the two major ones are, are honeysuckle and buckthorn. 
So th those are the two plants that are, are just pervasive. So um, there, you know, the invasive plants, there's so many of them. Um, and we probably have examples of just about everything. You know, wild chervil is another real problem, uh, but in, in bittersweet can be a significant problem. But we don't have the incidence as heavy as some other parts of the state. And even the difference between Grand Isle and Franklin County are also dramatic. Um, the Champlain Valley, the Champlain Valley has um, very heavy infestations of buckwheat and honeysuckle. Um, but you get up into the northern greens and there's far less impact there. Um, there's a lot of theory behind some of this. Some of it re is regarding to if the if uh, landscape had been plowed and the soil structure had been changed and soil biota had been diminished, then there's a, a, a chance for invasives to become established more easily. There's also where those plants were initially brought in. In the Champlain Valley, there, there was more wealth probably in those early years. And so bringing in plants that uh, were specimen plants, different from other things that was really popular uh, but in invasive worms, it's another problem where if there's invasive worms on the property, on this, this also um, exacerbates the, uh, the, plant, the invasive plant infestations. One of the issues about invasive plants, too, is how it, uh, it connects with, with climate change. All of the impacts of climate change are uh, giving an advantage to uh, invasive plants. So as we go forward, it's going to be harder and harder to manage these plants. Uh, they are succeeding with climate change. So we, that's another reason why we want to jump on it now and start managing our plants now so that we can get a handle on things. All right, so there's two more invasive plant questions. Uh, one still about honeysuckle. When you're disposing it, is there a special way to get rid of it? Like with uh, knotweed, wouldn't you have to put it in bags or can you let them dry out in the compost or is there some other way to dispose of honeysuckle? Yeah, so I, I would actually, what we, we tend to do with both honey, honeysuckle and buckthorn is to hang them upside down so that the roots aren't touching the ground. Uh, so, because if the roots, if you put them in a compost and the roots are touching the ground, they can, they can then spread. Um, the, as far as the seed goes, the fruit, um, I'm not sure what, what the length of viability is for either buckthorn or honeysuckle. If anyone else does know, I'd be curious. So one of the things is there's always going to be that seed, that seed that was dropped before, and that means that you need to continually monitor because those, uh, those plants will, can become reestablished. But getting those roots off the ground, if you only have a few plants, I just hang them in a tree. You pull it out of the ground and put it in a tree. Uh, it helps. Good. And then do you have advice for removing bittersweet? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep doing it. Um, okay, you know, it, bittersweet actually is one of the most difficult plants to uh, eradicate. It just seems uh, to persist and persist. Uh, herbicide is almost an, a necessary uh, evil, if you wanted to call it that, it's, it, it works. You know, um, some herbicide is targeted and done thoughtfully with experts helping out. That's a means for eradication of or, or management of invasive plants. Um, bittersweet is a perfect example of what you can do for targeting is you can cut the plant and then apply the, the glyphosate in, in the fall when the when it's translocating into the roots, and that can certainly help. But the, it is it is an incredibly um, hardy plant, uh, very very difficult to get rid of. Uh, so and that's one you want to start early with. And sometimes this is a constant effort. You know, keep cutting it back so it's not climbing up into the trees and spreading the fruit around. As we know, bittersweet is a powerful plant. It can pull down a mature tree. And once the vine entwines around a tree, it can pull it right to the ground. So um, I guess that's the best advice I have on bittersweet is to keep after it, perhaps think about an herbicide. All right, good. Uh, so let's move on to 
uh, looks like some UVA related questions. Uh, what are common reasons that county foresters reject or re request revisions to the forest management plan? Question. Um, so one of the things that we do when we look at a plan, we want to uh, approve a plan. When I see a, a management plan, I want to be able to visualize that forest, that stand by what I'm reading. So I need to know what it looks like without going out onto the land itself pre-harvest so and then i need to know if there's a prescription on that on that stand i need to know based on what i can read in that plan what that forest is going to look like post-harvest so i need to have enough information so i can visualize the before and the after so i know what i'm looking at when i go out onto the landscape to do an inspection so that's really the bottom line is that i need to have enough information so I can see what it, what it is before and after. And that's usually what I ask for, for clarification. You know, it's unlikely that a plan is ever denied. It, sometimes a plan needs work. And uh, that, can sometimes, that does take time occasionally. Most of the time, there's simple clarifications. Most of the time, it's uh, related to the silviculture, the prescription that has been defined, whether it's meeting um the the data that's provided whether that's going to actually work um uh, with that prescription so clarifications are usually asked for I have a really excellent relationship with the um consulting foresters in in the area the one the people that work up here uh oftentimes people work alone they're putting a forest management plan out i know personally i have a very difficult time self-editing so when I write something down, I may miss things. Even if you've read it three times, I get a lot of, uh, a lot of the consultants will thank me when I find something that's just missing. They didn't notice it. So it's really, it's a collaboration. Uh, and that collaboration uh, assists in helping the leaders. The other thing that I find uh, really necessary is when I do meet with landowners, which I love, I love going out and walking with landowners on their forest, even before a forest management plan is put in place, before they've had conversations with their consulting forester. Because one of the things about um, folks that landowners will often say, well, you're the expert. You know, you decide. You, you're the one that, that should tell me what I'm supposed to do. When in reality, the forester should be working for the landowner, and the landowner needs to tell the forester what it is they want from their landscape. It's just often hard to come up with those questions or those uh, the direction to, to um, assist the consulting forester. One of the things I can do is walk the landscape, find out what people really want from their from their forest, and then find ways to explain what the, how they can get there, what they can what they can do to their landscape to meet their needs and that way they can talk to their consulting forester and get a plan written that actually reflects their their desires their needs their goals um, other times i'm out in, on the landscape after a forest management plan is written and sometimes when i talk about what the plan has said a landowner may say well wow that's not exactly what i thought was going to happen here and so we can get things clarified plans can be amended uh, and it's an ongoing process for a landowner to um, continually work on their property. There's a relationship they have with their consulting forester. Uh, to me, it's a long, these are long-term goals. Uh, so I went a little bit further than what the question actually was, but uh, it, it is, it's a complex thing to have a forest management plan that you can follow over time that's going to, again, meet your needs. And we also have to remember that we need to sometimes change those, those uh, objectives because things in the forest have changed. Occasionally there's disturbance that has come through and you may need to adapt. So with climate change in particular, uh, being able to adapt your forest management goals um, and may need to happen. All right, good. Um, so here's a question from Janet Bisbee. She wants to know, what are some issues for determining whether to timber or tap trees? Is there data on economic and environmental considerations? 
Oh, there's, you know, there's so many reasons why you would want to tap or not tap. Um, economically, at this point in time, uh, most of the, the trees are probably worth more to tap than they are to manage for timber, um, unless you get to the very high valued uh, uh, stems. The veneer, veneer trees are definitely more valuable to keep growing for timber than to tap. But that's not the only reason you might want to choose to sugar or not sugar. Um, so there are the issue of uh, recreation, aesthetics. Do you want to, how are you using your property? Do you have trails on your property? Do you, um, are you interested in managing for wildlife primarily? A, a lot of these um, opportunities we have, timber, sugaring, wildlife habitat, they are compatible. One of the projects we have uh, going on with Audubon Vermont is uh, the maple friend, bird, ma bird friendly maple. So we're, we can go out and um, recognize landscapes, recognize sugar bushes for, for managing for songbirds. Um, there's ability to include that in your retail work so that you can, you know, people that love birds may want to buy your syrup before they buy someone else's. So things are compatible, but it really depends on your own goals and objectives. Uh, so one of the things, sugar, sugar bush management is kind of an area that I spend a great deal of time on in Franklin County. Uh, at, up to this point, at least, we are producing twice as much syrup in this county as the rest of the state combined. So you can imagine that I spend a lot of my time talking about sugaring. Uh, and I'm really happy to talk uh, more about this. I think I'm gonna see if I can, Kathleen, give me a, I'm gonna try to share my screen just for a minute here. Um, this has disabled the participant. Can you all see that? Um, that? I made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, is that happening? Not yet. Okay. Sorry, well, I guess that's not going to happen. Uh, have you, uh, do you have access to the share screen at the bottom? Oh, oh. you got muted. You got, yeah. <laughs> no, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Yeah, can you, can you use that share screen button at the bottom? It's kind of lost everybody at this point. Um, Uh-oh. Yeah. You're still there. You can see me, but I can't see you. We can see you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad this is, glad that's the case. Um, Do you have the share screen button activated at the bottom? Is it green? Yeah, no, I've lost you entirely. Um, oh, yes. She did. Well, hopefully we will have Nancy return in a moment. <laughs> there she is. She's back. I think I'll avoid the screen sharing from now on. <laughs> okay. Just, just for this one. Um, so we can continue with sugaring anyway. Is that uh, we, I have a, a, a large area. A lot of the landowners that I work with uh, are sugar makers. Sugaring is, of course, a very, um, I can explain a little bit why Franklin County is such a dominant sugar making county. We are also one of the top uh, agricultural counties. Uh, Addison, Orleans, and Franklin County are the three top uh, dairy, uh, dairy counties. So we have more farming and it does relate to sugaring. So farmers have always been sugar makers. And at, when sugaring became more and more profitable, and dairy became less profitable, um, there was a lot of diversification that has taken place. And sugaring is, a re is really hard work. So uh, farmers know about hard work. And so the farming communities have moved into sugaring at a more dramatic rate than other parts of the state. It's really interesting because Franklin County does have really good soils. We have really excellent um, syrup production, but there are other parts of the state that have that potential as well and have far less sugar sugar bushes going on there. Uh, so if you know when I get back to that question, I've, whoever, whoever asked the question can uh, focus me again if you'd like 
uh, about what your aunt, what you were really looking for. Which is better, tapping trees or growing trees for timber? It really is what you want to do in your forest, uh, and we can do both at the same time. Um, the old days of having really big crown trees and grazing underneath them with the cows, that's gone. We're growing trees at much closer together, both for timber and sugaring. There's very little difference actually in the management of uh, between the two. The only, the, the largest difference is the, the length of uh, the age of the trees. We're growing sugar trees probably longer than we grow timber trees. So we're, we're having longer rotations, but we still manage them the same way that we, we think about management in general. Management is really related to natural stand dynamics. So how trees grow naturally is how we manage them. And we're gonna manage them similarly for sugaring and for timber. We wanna have species diversity. We don't want monocultures in our sugar bushes. We don't want them all to be sugar maple. Um, we know that that is harmful in the long run on many reasons. One, that defoliation is far more um, prevalent in a pure sugar maple stand than it is in a stand that has a mix of species. But there's all sorts of other things. We know so, re we really know so little about how our trees grow and what they need. We're finding out more and more all the time. And one thing we do know is that different species work together. So they're adding different nutrients, they're adding different levels. So when things, when different species are working in the same landscape they're adding they're helping each other out so we really want to have a diversity of species and for climate change adaptation we also want a diversity of structure we want multiple age classes we want big trees and little trees we want to think about regeneration in our forest so all of those things are the same um, both for timber and for sugaring i'm happy to talk more about that too if there's questions We've got more questions. Um, so, but Janet said that that was helpful to think of it as a both and, not an either or. So. <laughs> yeah, all options are open. <laughs> uh, so, John McNerney wants to know, can you talk a little bit about what is involved in the clearing an area and ESTA in a forest management plan? Yeah, so eco ecologically significant treatment areas are a fairly new component to the current use program and that came about in 2010 to recognize that there are really special places in our forest and those special places need to be differently than um, than we and sometimes not harvested uh, it it really depends on the condition of the forest so to enroll an esta there's different kinds of estas um, there's a the riparian estas and the old forest esta can be um, can be approved directly by the county foresters, uh, but natural communities and uh, rare threatened and endangered species as does those need uh, assistance with the Fish and Wildlife Department through the Heritage Program. So we work with our partners uh, in approving those. And because the Heritage Program has a very high standard, it needs to, any of the ESTAs that enroll there need to meet those same standards. So in order to enroll a natural community ESTA, you really need to document all of the species in that, uh, in that area. You identify the polygon of which, or the area, the landscape that's included in that natural community. And then what you need to do for approval is to document uh, on a 20 by 20 meter um, plot, all of the species, not just the trees, but all of the herbaceous species as well. And um, sometimes that's a little difficult for some uh, consulting foresters who haven't had a lot of training in, uh, in botany. So sometimes we bring in some uh, ecologists to help out. So it, different ESTAs are, have different variations of uh, difficulty in enrollment. Uh, I can, for one, one thing that I could do as a county forester, if you have what you think is a natural community, or if you just wanna know, I can come out to your property, we can walk around, and I can easily identify uh, different natural communities. I've uh, had personally I've had a lot of interest in this for, for decades, so um, I, can, I can help uh, help you discover and find uh, something different, unusual, sometimes rare, uh, always cool, 
on your property. Um, one of the things that I find most rewarding about my job is that I can, every single landscape I go out on, there's something totally awesome that I can find that you might not have seen before. And there's nothing better than one of my mottos is you only see what you know. So if you haven't discovered something and I can help you see it, you'll never not see it again. You're always going to, it's always going to be there. So you only see what you know. You only see what, uh, you only um, love what you see and you only protect what you love. So um, that can be a, a little bit on the abstract, uh, but it, it uh, certainly works. So the more you know about your property, the more you're going to love your property. Um, okay, so Jack just posted a follow-up about Estas. He says he has some amphibian breeding habitat that he'd like to declare as an Esta. Would that qualify? It's Absolutely. frogs and spotted salamanders. Yes, definitely vertical pools are, can be actually enrolled in two different ways. It can be enrolled as a natural community or it can be enrolled, enrolled as a significant wildlife habitat. The natural community designation is, is, has a higher standard. It's greater protection. So you, um, and it's easily done this time of year. Uh, I, on my own property, have identified um, uh, three, four vernal pools. And so you just need to be able to document um, with egg masses. So uh, wood frog egg masses or spotted salamander egg masses, Jefferson, um, blue spotted, just finding those egg masses and documenting them with photographs. And then to identify and map out the coarse woody material within that 100 foot um, breeding zone uh, around the pool, uh, then you can enroll. That's what you need to enroll as a natural community. You could also enroll it without documentation of uh, breeding uh, by enrolling it as a significant wildlife habitat. In that case, you, there's a, you, you can't find that no cut zone. So the ideal vernal pool has at least 100 feet around it that's no cut, that you're never going to harvest anything. And then an additional uh, 500 feet where there's minimal harvesting or harvesting that is a uh, single tree or um, just keeping, a a, keeping the canopy intact because you really want to maintain shade and no roads within those areas um, because roads can often fool a, uh, a traveling amphibian where they would drop their, they would breed and um, lay their eggs or drop their eggs uh, in, in something that will dry up. So trying not to have roads in, the, in those life zones. So there's, again, two ways to do it. Um, the higher protection would be as a natural community. Excellent. So let's change gears a little bit. Um, Shauna asked a while ago, how did you get into forestry? Oh, that's a good question. I'm just one of those people that has been very lucky to know what I've always wanted to do. When I was a very young girl, I spent a lot of time in our, our woods on our farm. And even before I knew what foresters were, I knew I wanted to be one. Uh, so I started working in, the, my first job was uh, working for the Youth uh, Conservation Corps when I was 15. And uh, my mentor, one of my mentors in the forestry world is Ross Morgan. And uh, Ross was my first, uh, gave me my first letter of recommendation for any job I ever had. And uh, I wish I still had that letter. I wish I had. <laughs> um, and, and so I have, um, you know, I, I, took, I, I took vocational forestry in high school, which was a little difficult. I was the first girl in the class and uh, I was also so-called college track and they didn't want college track kids going into vocational school. Um, so I worked my way around it, uh, made sure I could got my schedule in place and uh, they had to agree with me. Uh, and, you know, so I, I, I have wanted to do this my whole life. Um, I actually wanted that my sister um, cut out an article once or saved an article that uh, when I was 15, I said, I wanted to be Sam Hudson when I grow up. Sam Hudson was the county forester uh, when I was a teenager and he was my predecessor. There's only been four county foresters in Franklin County. Um, the first uh, county forester was Charles Weir. He was there for a few months 
Sam took over, and then Jim Tessman took over from Sam, and now it's me. So I actually succeeded in becoming Sam Hudson when I grew up. Uh, so I have had a wonderful career. I'm actually getting at the end of my career at this point, uh, and I have to say this has been the job, a dream, the dream job, job of a lifetime. It's been wonderful. That's excellent. Um, okay, so back to uh, practical forestry. What do you suggest for boundary marking? There is a certain protocol for boundary marking. Of course, we can't, unless you're a surveyor, you can't actually put ax marks in your tree. You can, however, paint your trees. Um, and using boundary paint is the way to go because it lasts a long time. The, um, it's without being able to share my screen or having information, it's, it's hard to describe exactly how to do it, except the paint always has to go to the line. So if the trees are directly on the line, then you paint as you're walking along the line, you paint so you're seeing it. Now, if the trees are offset on the line, the paint still faces the line. So you can see it from every direction you're coming from. Uh, those trees become monuments, particularly the, the trees that are on the line. Those trees cannot be cut um, as, the, as they become boundary trees. But I, that finding boundary lines is just a, one of my favorite things to do. Sometimes lines are in pretty poor condition. So when you're out there trying to get your line established, you certainly don't want to be putting paint on trees until you know exactly where that line is. Lines, you need to look at your surveys. You need to make sure that you're not marking somebody else's line or making a mistake along a, a stone wall or a fence line that isn't actually the line. So you really need to flag out your boundary lines first document, make sure they're in the right location, perhaps even um, employ a surveyor if, it, if things are really, um, really sketchy to make sure you're in the right place. Because it can be a real problem if, you've, uh, if you identify lines that aren't yours. Um, but I have to say the boundary lines are one of the first things people should do. You should walk your lines, know where your lines are, walk your lines regularly to make sure there is no timber trespass. And uh, you know, timber trespass isn't always intentional. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's a mistake. And so, what you need, and the best way to avoid those mistakes is to make sure your lines are well marked. So, flagging, paint, documentation, walking them regularly to make sure that there is no mistakes happening. Uh, you can't blame someone when there is no evidence of line, and someone cuts trees on your property but there was no way to know where that line was. So oh, extremely important to put lines, uh, get your lines established. And it's fun. I have to say, one of the, I just love being able to locate a line. Um, sometimes you, there's like a whole, a long distance where there's nothing, but you've got two trees and you know that you've got those two trees that are clearly lines, they have blazes on them, then you have to find in between. And, find, and sometimes you find this old fence line that's been under the leaves for 50 years. And you, so you, you keep finding that evidence. It's like a puzzle. It's like putting a puzzle together. Great, great fun. <laughs> yeah, we need to do that on our property, actually. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I hope it's fun. A lot fun. of people do. <laughs> um, John just wanted you to clarify, can a non-surveyor create new paint marks on trees or just refresh existing marks? You should refresh existing marks. Um, so if you know that there is a line there, you, the best thing to do is, ref unless you have strong evidence, fence line, sometimes there's a fence line, then you can paint, you can paint trees that way too. But it has to be evidence. You can't paint trees without evidence. So you need to have something on the ground that's telling you that that is the boundary line. Good. Um, I don't... I think we've covered every question I see so far. Um, Marcia made a comment a while ago back to maple uh, that bulk maple syrup prices have dropped again this year. So the economics of maple production have become more challenging. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, so of course the uh, markets are always changing and uh, the pandemic hasn't helped with, uh, with market prices. Uh, exports are, are a little bit more difficult um, the Canadian dollar, the, the reason that things have dropped this year has been more regarding the, the, the dollar. 
the, the Canadian dollar because it is the Canadian market that uh, rules the worldwide sugar um, markets. Uh, we are a drop, Vermont is a drop in the bucket com of uh, production compared to, to Canada. So um, we will follow whatever Canada markets are. And uh, they do fluctuate and they fluctuate for all kinds of reasons. Um, we have had a pretty good year this year. Um, the prices aren't bad. There's, they're still up there. They've dropped a little bit. Uh, I think 15 cents lower this year per pound. But um, the, the organic premium uh, brings that back. The organic premium is 15 cents on a pound. So um, things are not bad. I've heard some really good reports actually for this year's um, crop. Uh, the, the warmer bushes didn't do quite as well, but the cold bushes did great. High elevation, there's actually people that are still, um, still boiling out there. They're, they're doing um, you know, kind of the, the, the commercial market that uh, we, we, it's, not to, it's not syrup you'd wanna eat, but it's syrup that can be added to other products. So people are actually still out there collecting and, and boiling. Um, it's cold right now. They, there's still snow on the mountains. So the market's still continue. The, uh, the, the year's still continuing and people had average year, average year to a good year, depending on what, um, what elevation you're at. But you know, the thing about sugaring is that it's always gonna, it's like farming. It's, it's the, the markets change. And so you can't base, and that is a mistake. There might've been, at one point there was like several years in a row that had just crazy wonderful years and people base their, um, their uh, debt or their borrowing on those really good years. And then that's gonna be a problem. So you really need to find out what those average markets are and be ready for a bad year, because uh, we will have them. Okay, so back to the boundary marking. <laughs> uh, Jack said he's been told to never cover up an old blaze, even if it's very faint. Yeah, so I've been mar I've marked a lot of boundary lines. One of the things you always want to do is retain some evidence of the previous mark. So if there's old paint, don't cover up all the old paint. Make sure you can say that there's, this is what I'm painting over. So you, you show that, that mark. The blaze itself, if it's a clear blaze, the blaze is going to be visible. Um, blazes are also visible for a very, very long time. Even once they're healed over, you can see a blaze. And so painting the blaze isn't gonna cover the blaze, but painting old paint is, is not, a, you shouldn't do that. You should always, leave a little bit of that old paint showing uh, to prove that you were painting over what was already there. That's a good, really excellent point. All right, good. And then Ken wanted to know about using GPS coordinates for boundary marking. Well, GPS is a great tool. Um, so you can really, you can find your lines well with the, with the GPS if you're skilled in that regard. Um, I think you're, you're still not going to be painting based on GPS. You need to have ground evidence. Unless you're a surveyor, that GPS is simply a tool and not to be used without other ground evidence. You can flag lines. I mean, flagging is not permanent. What's permanent are blazes and paint. And paint is actually not permanent, but it can last a long, it can last decades if you use the right kind of paint. So you shouldn't be painting trees without evidence. You shouldn't be establishing evidence. That evidence establishment is only done by a licensed surveyor. I hope that helps, you know. But you know, you can always get flagging and, and flag your lines. And then that way you can get to know your lines too. So the more you get out there with it in walking your boundary lines, that just gives you a sense of where your property is. Uh, and I know sometimes people, um, when they first buy a property or they they don't know it they're not it's not familiar so the best way to get familiar is to walk all of your boundary lines and then you then you can start moving it off of those lines i know it's really interesting often when i go for an inspection with people they that's the first thing people want to do is walk a boundary line and and i think that's cool if you want to find the lines and i'm happy to do it but that, i usually say well let's get off this line and go out into the middle of the forest and and see what you've got there because the lines aren't really um, off, they're not often indicative of what the whole forest looks like. 
All right. So on to a, a, another topic here. What are your favorite birds and which ones are you seeing and hearing right now? Oh gosh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so my very favorite bird is the black bearded blue warbler. And, uh, and that has become my favorite bird through my work with uh, Audubon Vermont in the Foresters for the Birds program, the Forest Bird Initiative. Uh, so I've been uh, very involved for the last 12 years on this project with Audubon. And one of the things we do is that we, we work with what we call, we have, we have 40 responsibility birds in Vermont. And those responsibility birds are birds that are either in decline worldwide or have a very specific range that is where we are. So for instance, black-footed blue warbler, its global range, its global breeding range is really Vermont, New England. So it doesn't have a large uh, global breeding range. So it's really important for us to take care of it. So that makes it a responsibility bird. Uh, the Foresters for the Birds program took 12 of those responsibility birds and created what we call the birders dozen. And that birders dozen um, is, the birds were picked for a few reasons. One, because they're easily identifiable either by sight or sound, and that they also occupy a particular niche in the forest. So each of those 12 birds occupy a certain different area of the forest, either low to the ground, a wetland, early successional habitat, kind of mid-story nesting, different spots in the forest that are represented by that bird. But once you have uh, that bird is represented, it encompasses all of the rest of the 40 responsibility birds. So if we're managing for those 12 birds, we're managing for all the responsibility birds in Vermont. So in what the point of this program was to keep common birds common. So all of these, these birds weren't picked um, because they were rare, threatened, or endangered. They were picked because they are commonly on the landscape still, and we want to keep them on the landscape. So the reason black-throated blue warbler has become my very favorite bird, first of all, it's a beautiful little bird, um, gorgeous blue color with a black throat and it doesn't have an awesome song except it's very identifiable it's z z z z that's the that's kind of the the sound that i make it sort of sounds like the bird um it's i haven't heard one yet uh the foliage isn't out the birds aren't all back they're just starting to migrate back now i haven't heard a lot of birds yet i have seen some common birds out there um but the nesting season hasn't started and that's when, just before the nesting season, is when you start hearing all the singing. Uh, and the black-throated blue warbler, for me, uh, it occupies, for nesting habitat, it occupies that zero to six feet high in the forest. It nests really low. So that is regeneration. So that's the regeneration in the forest. And as a forester, the most important part of the forest for the future is that regeneration. What we do when we manipulate the forest we're, we're almost always manipulating it for, for regeneration. So that, because that's the future. So whatever we're doing, we're thinking about what that regeneration is. And I've been doing that my whole life. But as soon as I started learning about the birds and where they, where they live in the forest, I look at it so differently now. I look at it, it, it has become even more important to me. And I think about that bird when I'm looking at that, that, that regeneration in the forest. And it's, it's really, this bird really loves northern hardwoods. So when I see a sugar bush that is full of regeneration, I'm saying that that's a healthy sugar bush, but it's also healthy for the environment and it has a future. And there, so when you're thinking about that regeneration, you don't wanna go through a forest. When you go through a forest and you can see for a long distance, that's not truly a healthy forest. You want lots of structure in the forest. So young forests tend to be, very simple and not have a lot of structure. So you wanna work that forest so you have developed structure in the forest. Um, it's a long answer to a short question, what's your favorite bird? Um, but uh, that's, uh, and I have lots of other favorite birds too, you know, scarlet tanager. I, I love the scarlet tanager, chick burr, chick burr. So you hear that little noise and you know exactly what it is. You can look up at the top of the tree and there it's going to be this beautiful black winged red bird. Uh, so I'm not a birder, 
I probably could identify just a few birds a few years ago, but little by little, I'm I'm gaining, and uh, and it makes the forest so much more enjoyable uh, to to know what you're listening to, know what you can see. Um, uh, the Foresters for the Birds program has been one of the most successful programs that the state of Vermont has ever initiated. Uh, Michael Snyder, our current commissioner, was his his baby to start with. Um, and uh, we have made this a nationwide program now. Uh, we, it, was, it began in Vermont with Vermont Audubon, or Audubon, Vermont, sorry, and, uh, and then kind of traveled up and down the Atlantic uh, Flyway. It's now in the Midwest, in Oregon. It's across the country, it truly is. It's an incredibly successful program because there are so many people that love birds. Excellent. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I wonder if there's any other big topics that you want to, or even little topics <laughs> that you want to talk to us about. Well, I'd be uh, so interested in if anybody wanted to ask a direct question. Um, that that would be wonderful. It gives me a direction. But one of the things that, uh, as I, as a, you know, we all have certain specialties. We all have certain interests, and uh, my interest primarily is uh, exemplary forest management, ecosystem management, and uh, conservation. So I have been involved with uh, land conservation for uh, several decades now. And uh, for me, that's the most important mission probably in my career and in my private life, uh, that we have a planet that is under a great deal of stress. Uh, we are, when, I always say this to people is that, you know, I, I am, I'm, I'm gaining in years now, but uh, when I was born, there were three and a half billion people on this planet. Uh, they were approaching eight billion now. We won't be topping out until we reach 10 billion. So for the next, and that's gonna be, that's kind of a, I think of it as a bottleneck of about a hundred years, perhaps 80 to a hundred years before we get to that peak and start going back to a lower population. This planet is the healthiest probably at a, population of people of around four and a half billion. And that's gonna take a long time to get back to that. But we are in that direction. Uh, we are, the, our rate of population is definitely diminishing. The rate is, that doesn't mean population is diminishing yet, but the rate is certainly is. But when I talk to people, this is the most important thing we can do in the next, in our lifetimes, is to be smart about how we develop and be smart about how we manage our forests. Uh, and being smart really includes that ability to um, handle climate change, handle all the stresses that come with climate change, to diminish climate change, to um, stop using fossil fuels the more and more we can so that we are no longer putting carbon in the air, uh, and also to be thinking about how we can store and sequester more carbon in our forests. So conservation, uh, carbon management are two priorities of mine. We have a wonderful, uh, the uh, Vermont conservation design that has been put together by the Agency of Natural Resources, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Forests and Parks. Um, that, go Google that, um, Vermont conservation design. This is a vision of maintaining our um, ecological integrity across the state. And not only across the state, but across the Northern Forest. The Northern Forest is, uh, is a area that runs from west of the uh, Adirondacks and the Tug Hill Plateau, all the way up to the tip of Cape Breton, includes four states, three provinces. Um, and this is a, uh, an area that is similar in climate and has a similar species. It is the most, this, this is something that I just want you all to remember. Uh, it is the most intact broadleaf temperate forest in the world. This is a globally significant forest that we live in. This means that we have a, um, a responsibility to protect it. Vermont's right smack dab in the middle. If we lose our connectivity in Vermont, we have, di we have diminished the ecological integrity of both um, the western part of the northern forest and the eastern part. We, have, we are the middle and we need to maintain this um, and keep it whole. Uh, keep it whole for the future. Again, it comes back to our responsibility to have a, have a planet, a functional, ecologically 
uh, intact planet for the future, not just for us, but for, for down the road. And we only, and we can, if we lose it, it's real hard to restore, much harder to restore than it is to, to maintain. So, um, and I think the best way to do that, I, I'm a real fan of uh, Ed Wilson, Eel Wilson, and he's coined the term half earth. So half of the earth for, for um, nature and half of the earth for us. So we are very, very, very far from that at the moment. I think we've reached about 17% of the, of the earth being permanently um, protected from development. 3% uh, of it's the ocean and uh, a little bit more on land. We have a long way to go. Uh, we should be looking at 50%. Uh, Vermont has got, uh, got some good players here, right? We've got the Vermont Land Trust is a nationally known uh, land trust, um, very significant. We've done a lot of good work. Uh, we have the state lands, the Green Mountain National Forest. We've, we've got a head start, uh, but we have a long way to go, and, a, and it's important for us to be the role models that we like to call ourselves sometimes. So I, I, I think that, that I, if I could finish with that, if that's the end of what we're talking about today, that is really for me the very, very most important piece. And it's, it's long-term conservation. It's easements on the landscape that are permanent, that thing where things aren't lost down the road. Um, so I guess that's, that's, that's my last comment, unless there's some other good questions around that topic as well. Well, as soon as I said there weren't any more questions, two came in. <laughs> but um, uh, let's see if we can answer these before we close. So the first one, are, are there any cases of red pine scale in Vermont? Oh, I don't think I know the answer to that. Um, so sorry, don't know the answer. OK. And then um, in open grown maples, why do the lower branches swoop down and then back up? Ooh, swoop down and then back up. Um, so when open grown maple, of course, has got has sunlight all, all around it. So the trees aren't self pruning. So that, that's why you have a very large low crown. Um, so swooping down, I, you know, I really don't know the answer to this either, because certain trees do have characteristics. For example, green ash does weep. You can actually identify green ash from white ash because it's got a weeping branch pattern. Sugar maple, I don't actually think of it like that. I, I, I don't think of them as swooping down, but gravity may have something to do with it. I'm looking at someone at the window right now, and I'm not actually seeing that. Those branches are going up. Um, um, so they could, I'm not sure if I've ever seen that. So not answering that question either. My last two questions, I don't know the answer to, <laughs> but um, trying. Yeah, that's okay. I, um, Oh, John McNerney said, maple branches chasing the sunlight swoop down to get to sun coming under upper branches. So that's his theory, maybe. That's a good theory. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like that's it for the questions. Um, Kathleen, do you have closing things? Well, I have put our websites in the chat box there for Vermont Coverts and Vermont Woodlands, and you can um, visit those sites, check out our calendars for things coming up, uh, look for recordings on our Facebook and YouTube channels, uh, and I've also put Nancy's email in there if you have any direct questions for her. Uh, she'd be happy to get an email from you uh, with those questions. So lots of thanks in there, Nancy. Great job. We really appreciate your time this morning and your expertise. Um, it's really nice to have so many folks involved and to be able to uh, tap into this great network of county foresters around Vermont. So much appreciated. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for, sh for showing up and asking questions. It's, uh, this is what we do, right? We wanna, we wanna talk to people. Um, so this is great that we've been able to do this. And thanks, Kathleen, for getting, making this happen. Thanks, Nancy. Yep. So I think it's 10.01. We are going to say goodbye for this morning. Uh, we're working on next Friday. I think we're going to see David Paganelli with us next Friday morning. Uh, so just check for those announcements.
Thank Great. you folks for joining us. Hi everyone.